so you guys can all see it later and laugh laugh my heart's beating fast because i'm nervous about all this it's okay if it crashes and burn we'll do it again next week yeah okay <laughs> um and then we're gonna share hopefully you guys see Ta -da! yes okay you ready turn your turn your uh, volume up please and mute please and mute here we go my husband wrote this for us well, my husband and I wrote this together, but here we go. Well, it's the end of the week. No way you've been. Well, now it's Feedback Friday. <laughs> Our dancing. Come sit down. It's very interesting. We've got to present it that you've never seen. We're Feedback Friday. We're on the loose. We'll be the train. You be the caboose. It's Feedback Friday with Kathy and Amy. Mashed potatoes and the gravy. It's Feedback Friday all day long. Feedback, Feedback, Feedback Friday. That was really, yeah. <laughs> So, that you know, so excellent. that's what we got. That's what we got for you. Mashed potatoes and gravy. I'm the potato. She's the gravy. All right. <laughs> it is like, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all that like 1980s dancing that you learned, do it next Friday. We're going to, John Marshall's going to be a, our guest and we're going to freak him out. All right. Okay, guys. Welcome to Feedback Friday. We have added a new level of silliness to our show, but we also are continuing with these awesome and amazing presenters. And so uh, today I'd like to, uh, well, you know who we are, right? We're Botanical Colors Feedback Friday. We're a natural dye studio based in Seattle. We've been cooped up in our studio since mid-March. This is episode 19. So we've done this for 19 weeks and uh, we're gonna keep going. <laughs> we're gonna keep going. So um, today our presenter is textile artist and natural dyer, Samantha Varone, who's joining us from New York. And uh, Samantha has a unique perspective on textiles and the use of textiles and the use of um, both found and gathered and foraged uh, dye stuffs. And so she actually specializes in rust. So being in an industrial New York um, location, she's found lots of it. She has these beautiful images she's gonna show us. Uh, she's been inspired by both the Japanese um, boro, which is the use of patching and mending rags until they're nearly tatters, but they just, you know, imbue this beautiful idea of use and reuse until you can no longer use. And by doing that, it transformed these, these really everyday pieces into works of art. Uh, as well as uh, Korean pojagi, which is a beautiful, very meticulously stitched um, patchwork, often on a very gauzy, rainy, or hemp background. It's quite lovely. So the seaming becomes part of the design. Uh, and all sorts of other vintage and otherwise discarded remnants. So this is going to be super interesting to see how Samantha's creative mind has looked at these uh, ideas and just created something brand new. Um, so Samantha focuses on um, labor intensive rather than depleting resources. So she'll reuse and reuse and everything is uh, handmade by her uh, in her studio. And she's been able to um, provide these products out to the world, including at ABC Home, Carpet and Home, uh, a store that I love called Oroboro and the Houston Museum of uh, fine arts gift shop. So join me. Wait a minute. I, I have this all written. It's like right here. So now I have to turn the page. I'm like, you know, those people who play the piano, but I don't have somebody to pay turn the page for me. Um, obviously, as you can see, 
Thank you so much for all your support. Um, it's just kind of kept us going during this extremely difficult time. And of course, we couldn't do it without it, you. I've told you every single week that there's a number of families that through your generous support and enthusiasm, we've been able to keep going and we totally appreciate it. So we can't thank you enough. Um, everyone will be muted for Samantha's presentation, but we'll open it up at the end for um, thank yous and you know, Amy, we probably need to have like a ending song too. So maybe we'll ask Jimmy. You know, I was thinking of, there's a lot of people here that might be like their first time here. So we've already thrown them a really weird curveball today. So I don't know if we should do any kind of finale song. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll think there. about it. We'll think okay. about I mean, it. Yeah. 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 Diamond and Diamond any Diamond classically Diamond. trained yeah. singers among us, you know, just raise your hand and um, we can give you the floor for yeah. the ending. Yeah. And also, Kathy, we'll, we'll have the uh, chat box. <laughs> so oh, right. The chat the box. Yes. Yeah, so volunteer. Chat box will be open. Um, so obviously we're recording this. The recordings are uh, sent around to everybody who uh, registered as well as they reside on the website uh, under videos is now um, what's on our blog, uh, the, the navigation uh, menu of our website so you can find all nine blah, 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 blah. you can find all 18 stop laughing Amy um, chapters of Feedback Friday on there um, just a few things uh, we had Porfirio Gutierrez here a few weeks back and he's going to be teaching a class on cochineal the Zapotec way um, that's going to be in September and so we just published that it was originally supposed to be in August, but he's got too many deadlines right now, so uh, we moved it to September. And it's being um, held at, Porfirio will be at Caddy Wampus in Ojai, which is just a magical store. They've got an online presence as well, so if you're interested, um, check out CaddyWampusCrafts.com, I believe. We'll put that um, URL in our resources. And um, then finally, we've got two last classes with Abu Bakar. Um, a five-day stitching class using indigo, so we're going to make these ginormous indigo vats and then also be working with traditional Malian strip cloth. Um, that's going to be super exciting. And then coming up next Wednesday, so we're a little tight on time, uh, is a four-day shibori class that Abu Bakar will be doing. And that's also going to be with a larger vat. So if you came and participated in the three-day classes, these are slightly larger vessels so that you can do uh, more work. All right. Um, I think that's it. Enough talking. Samantha, I am going to turn it over to you. And if you are ready, I'd like to welcome you to Feedback Friday. Thank you. take this in for a moment. Breathing is good. <laughs> thank you, Kathy and Amy, for having me. And thank you all for coming today. I have a lot of gratitude to be in the company of your other Feedback Friday guests who have inspired me over these months. I have really enjoyed learning about their different approaches um, and integrating creativity with service. And Really, thank you for exemplifying the adaptive spirit um, in providing this important resource, not just for us kooky dyers, but for citizens of the planet, I think, um, to view, to get a view into how cultivating a community with creativity and commerce has healing properties for us all. Um, these Zoom Feedback Fridays have just been like such a gem. And it turns out that natural dyeing techniques are really useful for living through a global pandemic and the attendant societal reckoning. Getting comfortable with uncertainty, having an open mind about the unknown, trusting a process where surprises are to be expected, willingness to adapt when something's not working, using mistakes to innovate. That's the terrain we're on when we're dying and when we're living, right? So the screeching halt of the coronavirus um, was for me welcome in ways, kind of an affirmation of that mindset and an opportunity to slow down the process even more and to observe and to trust where that goes. And that's certainly not to dismiss the tremendous suffering and loss that has taken place and that continues to take place 
But I just mean that the fear and anxiety has through soul searching and reading and communicating with people and working differently have given way to a, a new set of glasses through which to view my work and accept the precariousness of the world and in particular our deeply troubled corner of it. Acceptance doesn't mean approval and we do need deep change. I wrote some thoughts in this vein and posted them in a journal entry on my website along with links to resources that I found helpful. So please have a look at that if you're interested. And now I'm going to talk to you about dying with rust, how I discovered it accidentally, of course, and how moving from using th synthetic dyes to plant dyes has made the rust dyeing experience even more lively and fascinating. I'm going to show you how three different botanicals, avocado, onion skins, and black walnut make different effects on rust. And I'll also show you some applications with compost, some collaborative pieces, and works using patchwork uh, inspired by Japanese boro and Korean hojagi, uh, as Kathy spoke so beautifully about, um, great descriptions. Um, and there's such intelligent, elegant ways of using everything and wasting nothing. And I'll also tell you a little bit about how community building and support figure into what I do. And I will now share my screen. I hope. It goes a little slow, Samantha, so don't, don't worry. It'll... We're there, we're there. Okay, so rust, corrosive and suggestive of neglect and stagnation, it exemplifies the tension between permanence and ephemera. Rust is light, fast, and washable, and yet it is decay itself. It's a humble element that as a dye stuff is quite sustainable. Make rust by leaving anything metal outside in the weather for a time. It creates unique patterns and designs, and I mean that literally, no two imprints alike, which I find illustrates a worldview that values the old, the imperfect, the discarded, labor-intensive rather than resource-depleting production, and sustainable practices. Rust will burn through a piece of cloth unattended, so you have to get a feel for it. The more delicate the fabric, the quicker the cure time, and it can be anywhere from a few minutes in the heat and humidity of the summertime on a piece of silk georgette to weeks on heavy hand loomed linen or canvas or a heavy wool blanket in the cold winter time. That's actually not a blanket, that's, uh, that's drill bits on suede. Um, let's see. So, so this all started um, with a bundle of antique table linens I acquired uh, about seven years ago. I was interested in using materials that might otherwise end up in a landfill. And so friends and friends of friends brought old linens to me and some of these pieces had holes in them and needed mending and some were stained with rust and I momentarily thought about over dyeing or even bleaching the stains out, but decided it would be more interesting to work with the marks and to integrate them. They were part of the story of these antiquated and unusual pieces after all. So I used rusty nails and washers and bells that I had in the studio to augment the stains and create patterns. And I'm stuck. It's not moving. It's just slow, Samantha. If you get start getting the boop boop, it's it's typically just slow. Just give it a second. Okay, so how how does rust work and how does it function as a dye? I, I get that question a lot. The imprint is made by the rust's connection with the wet cloth. So it's the rusty object's continuous contact with the cloth that produces the mark. Uh, and I often will use water and vinegar solution along with it to facilitate the rusting, but it's really not necessary. Um, 
rust will do its thing without that, just in the presence of, of air and water. Um, but as I said, you have to get a feel for how long the cure takes by practicing. And sometimes I'll wrap a piece uh, in a rusty object and the imprint won't happen. So I'll rewrap it and leave it longer. It's very important to wear gloves when you're using, working with rust and make sure your tetanus shot is up to date of course. Wow, it's really not advancing. That's a bummer. Um, is there another way you can um, like hit a, an arrow or the space bar or something? Sometimes it just doesn't react to one of them. Try going the other direction, your previous slide. My husband's coming. He's the tech guy. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm gonna keep going. And I guess we'll go back because I have, I have some video that I wanna show you of the process. So research online brought me to experimenting with teas which contain tannin, those polyphenolic biomolecules uh, that bind to the fabric. And um, tannin, the the presence of tannin really has an interesting effect. Um, and that plant rust alchemy, I found really fascinating. And I discovered botanical colors in my uh, research online where I was able to get tannin powder made from gallnuts, which makes a more inky blue black. Yay, thank you, Johnny. Okay, so here's, the, here's a video. Uh, showing, laying in some, some rusty objects, most of them found. Those rectangles and squares are very heavy, which is nice because they really make a nice imprint. The weight is really helpful. And I'm spritzing with, with water and uh, vinegar. And I think this piece actually was also previously um, in a tea, it was tea dyed as well. So you'll see in the reveal, um, there's some gray spots and that's, that's where the tea is. And that's how it works. It's just that simple. So here are the, the black tea tests from my test book. Um, more tests with tea and, and rust liquor. I'll get back, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so I began to collect rusty pieces. The steam show upstate was a good spot to find rusty metal. Um, I really try to find forged steel or um, cast iron. I find uh, works best. I stay away from things like copper and, and tin um, just because, and uh, Kathy helped me out here. I think those, are, those metals are probably kind of dangerous. Um, so that's what I've heard anyway. So I avoid working with them. Um, but this, th these pieces here um, are from a very old stovetop. Uh, these metal bits. It's not going again. Samantha, I can talk about copper uh, a little bit. So I think a copper pipe, um, we use it like in a dye bath, right? I don't use copper sulfate as a mordant because it is um, considered toxic and it's actually listed as a carcinogen right. or a suspected carcinogen. But um, copper in like a pipe or copper pieces, I have a bunch of copper pieces from a, a jewelry lab from Haystack last year. I think all of those are relatively benign because you, it, you're not transforming it really mm -hmm. in any way. Um, if you make something called verdigris, if you guys have heard of that, where you add acid to copper, that is toxic. And it, it, you do need to be very careful when working with it. So 
Um, tin, I can't specifically speak to because I've never really used it, but um, copper for sure as a piece of pipe or a piece of, you know, copper scrap is fine in a dye bath and then I just remove it. And of course, we're always wearing gloves in this whole process. Right. Thank you for that. Okay, I guess I'm, I'm gonna be picking up some copper pipe on my next outing, looking around for, for rusty bits. Uh, so this, these are uh, forged steel nails on cotton. And this is, these are drill bits and barn door hinges on cotton with gallnut tannin. And, uh, and this looks like the grade eye from Lord of the Rings, doesn't it? Um, Mr. Frodo, on our way to Mordor. <laughs> uh, these are more barn door hinges inside there and uh, fi iron files and uh, nails on an old wool blanket remnant that was soaked in gallnut tannin and probably some logwood too. <sighs> Practicing patience, folks. So exactitude and replication are not what this is about. While it's not possible to color match precisely, it is possible to get close enough, I think, when, working, when I'm working with stores and clients and uh, people know that when they're buying a group of handmade placemats or napkins or pillows, that they're getting a particular edition and each edition is uniquely their own. So this is a military blanket uh, redeployed as a cape and more blankets dyed with gall nuts and hand embroidered edges and applique to cover holes and warm spots. Notice the pink, Do you see the pink? So this was one of the first pieces I ever dyed uh, and um, it's an antique linen tea towel and um, so that was about seven years ago, and I actually have it right here, and it's held up beautifully. Some people think that maybe the rust will eventually wear through because it never really stops the rusting process. It's kind of like bleach. It never really ends, but I think that um, I, I haven't had a problem with it. I, I, you do have to get a feel for how long you leave the rusty object to make an imprint. But once you do, I think it's, it's, uh, it's pretty stable. And uh, these are napkins, an example of shibori tie dyed with onion skins, avocado, logwood, and rust that uh, were dipped in rust liquor. So expanding my rust dye work has really been an exploration of, of how different plants, plant tannins react with rust. So the avocado, um, you know, I started, uh, a client had asked, had asked me to, to do a pink story um, for a home furnishings collection. And since I was turning my attention away from synthetic dyes to plant dyes, I began experimenting with avocado skins and seeds. I had no idea that the avocado, that the avocados contained tannin. So um, I was very surprised to find this dramatic changes in color. Uh, and once I started doing this, friends would drop off their avocado skins and seeds. Um, I, have, I have a friend who works in a restaurant and would bring just garbage bags filled. My freezer at one point was just filled with avocado refuse. <laughs> um, I think I figured out how to, how to solve the problem. Thank you, Johnny. 
So instead of putting the seeds and skins directly in the dye pot, I like to use muslin bags and then I don't have to strain the plant materials out of the pot before immersing the fiber. And then I, there's the added benefit of having create another useful object, these nice bags that can be used for gift wrapped or in the farmer's market. Now what I like to do is turn the, well, warm water has less surface tension, so the color uptake is faster. Um, but I like to turn the heat off and just leave the fabrics in the dye pot um, and see what happens. Take them out, let parts dry, um, reposition, allowing certain areas to dry and then resubmerging gives texture and nuance that will come alive later with the introduction of rust. So this, this here, this is, um, you can really see it, um, the effects that uh, just kind of organically happen. And there's a wide range from kind of beige to pink with avocados, so no two batches will be alike. So here's a very pink batch, and then here's a very beige batch. And it really just depends on where the avocados come from, and I guess when they were harvested, there's just so many variables. So this is the result of a multi-dip soak of reassigned painter's canvas turned into placemats. And uh, another example on a vintage wool cutter blanket turned into a small rug. And really see the, the transformation of the rust turning to um, the, the rust interacting with, with the avocado and turning kind of gray. And this one was dyed, um, wrapped and dyed in, in an avocado bath and then wrapped with, a, with rusty bits and then retied and re-dipped in a rust liquor after bath. So you really see both the avocado, the pink avocado, and then the kind of mauvey taupey color that happens with the interaction with the rust and then just solid rust areas. And I just, I really love that. And here are more examples of that mauvey taupey gray that the avocado rust union makes. And I love the halo, halo effect on the cast iron iron rest. And these are teas I had dyed for the fabulous hemp clothing company, Young Maven. And here's an example of antique hand cutwork linen placemats dipped for a few minutes on the on the left side, all the way to several hours for a gradient effect, and then wrapped in rusty bits. And here's the reassigned painter's canvas um, from what I call a, my stains collection. Um, I thought it was kind of a good idea to, to have a stains collection for a tabletop because stains always happen, you know, at the, at the table, right? So why not just go with it? Uh, so here you really see the, uh, the, the difference between the pink and uh, the mauve once you've introduced the rust. And this piece, this is an antique kimono that um, started out in the avocado bath and then had multiple reties and dips and redips in um, logwood with rust. And here's the rust liquor I'm talking about. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio of white vinegar to water with rusty pieces. You don't even really need rusty pieces. You could use a piece of steel wool or any metal object and uh, it will rust. So I collect onion skins at the produce section of the supermarket. And I think the, the, gross, the grocer appreciates the tidying up, actually. Um, and I, I've had many fun conversations with people, really interesting conversations, people asking me what I'm doing. I always come with a muslin bag that's been dyed with avocado or 
with onion skins or with any with something and so they can see what it is that I'm doing there. They are in the muslin bag. And the color can be very, very vibrant with the onion skins. It doesn't always stay. Um, it's weird, you know, sometimes that color will stay even with or without alum mordant. Um, I th it's sort of the spontaneous and arbitrary preference of the plant. So this is a, a rusty bit that I, that I found. And uh, it is wrapped with the onion skins and you see the transformation of the olive green. green. There's like a real olive OD color there. And that salmon color that happens, I don't know, it's just one of those, one of those things that happens with plant dyeing um, that I find so much fun. You just don't always know what you're going to get. And these are barn door hinges and files on painter's canvas. And here, here's some more tests. It's a test from my, from my book that this onion skin bath made such a deep kind of burnt sienna color and then dipped in iron uh, just made such a beautiful olive green. And here's the iron rest again. Now here I introduced spent tea bags with the, with the onion and rust and uh, got an interesting kind of gradient effect with grays and even blue that you can kind of, that has kind of a blue tint to it. Um, and here's another example with less rust and more rust on flower sack towels. So this is another Young Maven t-shirt that I dyed also with a rusty bit that I found in the street that was dipped in an, an exhausted onion bath. <sighs> exhausted, yeah, was that, was that onion bath tired? <laughs> the rust imprints in the cloth turned the onion bath olive and then turned shirt olive. So this antique linen nightgown was dyed with avocado on one side and onion skins on the other and then put into a rust liquor bath and this is the result. And this is an antique Japanese undergarment for wearing with a kimono dyed similarly. Um, I'm, I don't know, I'm really, I'm kind of fascinated by this doing one side with avocado and one side with onion and, and, uh, and then introducing rust and seeing what happens. I don't know, I just, I, I'm really exploring that with a lot of garments now. And this is an organic cotton caftan dip dyed in onion skins and then rust liquor. And you see that, you know, just the, the, the slow process of leaving it in the dye bath, you get these really nice marks that um, are just organic and unusual and look like stains. <laughs> they are stains. And this is an orangey yellow result on a wool cutter blanket reassigned as coasters. So, The dyes, the plant dyes on protein fibers, it's always going to be darker and richer. Um, the, the color uptake is just always better. So this is a good example of that. And um, so these, uh, these black walnuts, um, this is really kind of a story of friendship. A woman contacted me a couple of years ago to ask me if I would like uh, if I had ever died with black walnut and if I'd like some of hers, she has two giant black walnut trees on her property. And uh, she offered to send me a couple of boxes of them. She was collecting them. 
And, uh, and I said, well, I've never died with it, but I'll try it. And uh, just amazing effects. And um, it just this, you know, incredible kind of caramelly brown that turns to kind of deep bitter chocolate uh, to even black. Here are some tests. Just really beautiful effects. So these 30 inch square wool gauze pieces, I like to think of as convertibles. I like the idea of finding different ways to use the textiles I make. They don't have to be rigidly defined objects. And I love the idea of creating, creating seasonal collections based on plant availability that I can make a limited edition of these wool gauze pieces in the late fall. Nature in harmony with commerce. What a great idea. I used ferrous sulfate powder, thank you, Kathy, on these since rust liquor can have tiny fragments that can get caught and tear the delicate gauze. So here's another example of, um, this is on linen, of really just using multiple dips and drying out for days in between and tying and retying sometimes leaving in the dye bath for several days, weeks, um, to achieve color and texture. And again, time is just an essential ingredient, letting time have its way with the textile and kind of setting conditions for something to happen, but not having an agenda or a goal necessarily. Um, just kind of trusting the process and seeing what unfolds, which this slow process is really kind of a, a life lesson. So lots of layers of color um, here, beginning with, a, with uh, an avocado dye bath. Let's get Zora the cat in there. Um, she's always going into everything. Um, and here's the result. So these were both on with avocado, started out with avocado and then um, these sort of tied and retie dyed um, dips and soaks in black walnut with rust. And here's more painter's canvas. You know, I use a lot of painter's canvas because my husband's a painter. And uh, so he would produce these, you know, just boatloads of these ribbons of, of, of um, canvas. So that's why I have so much so much of it. He's not really working with canvas right now. So the materials that he's working with now, I don't think I can die on. So I, I'll have to look for some other um, recycled textiles. So this, this uh, is on cotton and this was onion that then I retied and put in the black walnut bath. And you can kind of see, I hope you can see it. There, it just made like this really interesting striations of burgundy and plum. Um, it's like the polyphenols and the, and the tannins just did some kind of crazy magic that I'd never really seen before. And I'm afraid to wash it, um, but I do know that the longer I wait before I wash something, the better the more staying power the color is going to have. So I generally, I don't wash things right away. And of course, when I finally do wash them, I'm washing them in a very mild pH neutral soap. And these are Shibori dyed antique linen cocktail napkins dipped in rust liquor following a black walnut bath. And here are tests on cotton and paper towel and wool and silk. And this is a vintage cutter blanket turned into hand warmers. Someone told me they looked like casts for a broken arm, so I dipped them in black walnut and problem solved. So 
So I'll quickly show you some of my experiments with compost and then move on to collaborations and remades. This is from fire cider that I make. So there are fresh chunks of turmeric and garlic and onion and horseradish, lemon, orange rinds, peppercorns mixed with rust. Um, this is on a, on a napkin. Many of these colors are not so stable. Um, the turmeric in particular is, is pretty fugitive. Um, you can see after I washed it, this was, the, this was the color it turned. So it's interesting, but it kind of looks nothing like what it was in the beginning. And here it is with, on, with the introduction of red cabbage, which is so vibrant and bright um, while it's wet and then fades quickly. But the point is to experiment with your food waste. I think that's, that's, that's always a good thing. And uh, this is a piece of um, wool bundle dyed with eucalyptus and rusty washers. And that combination makes a really good black. And here's rusting gallnut um, and rusting cabracho on paper. You know, for a long time when, when my kids were little, I, I would make cards because it was something that I could do creatively that kind of had a beginning, middle, and an end. And I could, I could make these little collages really easily and quickly. And I could feel like I was still making something um, in the midst of, of uh, single parenting. And uh, so I have a lot of cardstock around. So it's really fun to play around with, uh, with the cardstock. And um, and then I use them to write letters. This is a vintage chore dress dyed with rust and tea and coffee and mended with fabric remnants. And these are an antique linen hand loomed duvet cover and vintage linen pillowcase that were mended and renewed. They were very worn and I just, love, I mean, I save everything. So I love just taking small pieces and patching and over patching. And that's that kind of nod to, to the genius of Boro. And this is a hemp bedding coll collection collaboration I'm doing with Young Maven. And this is a piece I collaborated on with Thompson Street Studio and artist Susan Cianciolo for their run collection. I've been a fan of Susan's work for decades, and um, she had already inspired me to do these remade clothing pieces. So it was such a thrill to work with them on this. I have Kiva Motnik to thank for including me. And Kiva of Thompson Street Studio and I have done a few things together, like these screens collaborating with furniture designer Shin Okuda in the style of Kojagi, in this quilt. I feel like my presentation would not be com complete without a little talk about indigo. I haven't done a whole lot of dyeing with indigo and it's a very different process. Its relationship to oxygen is obviously very different than dyeing with other plant dyes and certainly with rust and the interaction with rust um, is not the same, I'll say. Um, but I need to do some more experimentation. Here's a, a jacket with, with rust and tea and uh, indigo. And antique indigo dyed Japanese textiles is, are really where I began. In 2011, collecting these gorgeous textiles, I became obsessed with boro cloth and mending and continuing what Jude Hill calls generational storybooks. And these are pillows and quilts and tapestries of antique boro textiles combined with rust dyed experiments and remnants from bigger projects, integrating and utilizing a zero waste approach to making objects in collaboration, um, hand stitch work, um, just reminds me of what Louise Bourgeois said about um, using the needle as a, as a claim to forgiveness. It's not aggressive, it's not a pin. 
um, it's about repairing broken things. And I, I just love that imagery when I'm working, this kind of slow mending. And it's, it's very meditative and um, I really enjoy it. And it just reminds me of the idea of creating an economy of care, craft, and culture, um, which brings me to POTS. I've been volunteering at POTS, part of the solution, in the Bedford Park section of the Bronx since I moved to Riverdale, the Bronx, uh, 13 years ago. My kids grew up volunteering here. Founded in 1982 as a tiny community dining room, POTS has grown into a one-stop shop providing a multitude of services to our neighbors in need, from a shower to clean clothes, to medical and dental care, to legal aid. Here's Rusty Staub, great friend and benefactor, cooking. Whatever is required to help our neighbors in need to move from crisis to stability, to self-sufficiency, to ultimately prosperity. This was a workshop I did on creating small business with a wonderful group of women. Their kids were at homework club. And um, when homework club is on, POTS brings in people to, to talk about career building. And uh, I think I learned a lot, a lot from those women that day, maybe more than I actually had to teach them. And right now I'm working on developing a Zoom art class for kids. A lot of the services, of course, are now remote. Morning pantry pickup and lunch service are all takeout, and they're really doing a fantastic job adapting to the current conditions. The time I spend at POTS reinforces an idea that I think America is getting a heavy necessary dose of now. And that's that my advantage of ancestry and geography makes me lucky not better or more deserving than the guests who we serve at POTS. And this luck that I refer to euphemistically is really a deep injustice that needs to be healed. I'll end with quotes from two forward-thinking economists whose ideas really come alive for me in dying with rust and making useful objects. I do believe that the two great tools of business and technology can and must serve the two great garments of human life, nature and culture. The focus on local, the specific, the sacred, I think is really the right move. Thank you for spending this time with me. Samantha, thank you so much. That was amazing. It was really great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Amy is going to go ahead and open up chat and you guys can ask your questions. Um, we've got a few minutes. So if there are questions that we don't answer here, um, Samantha, if you would like to, we can forward those to you and then we can add those to our um, post when we send around the video. Okay, okay good. Great. I've been doing that too, just adding everybody's questions at Til um, Tilka. We added hers in, Catherine Ellis, we've added hers in after. So, but that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, I had two, okay, you know, I'm just gonna, just gonna dive in over here. So do you mordant the fabric with any alum beforehand? Sometimes, not always. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's an experiment. Yeah. Um, I mean, like I said, I found that it doesn't, um, It doesn't always make a huge difference with the rust dyeing, I find. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know. Um, I, I guess with the, with, the, with, the, with the tannin, I mean, I'm working with, with, with plant stuffs that, are, that have a natural mordant in them. So it doesn't seem like the alum really yeah. does more. Yep. I know it's in, it's interesting when you're playing around with tea or the avocados that have that kind of built-in tannin. But it, yeah, other things are going to, of course, need more than. Right. Somebody, Jeanette is asking, do you scour the canvas before you before you do your dyeing? Do I scour it? Sometimes, mostly not actually. I have Just to play around a little bit on the 
from I don't time. scour it in that kind of traditional sense with this with the cellulose stuff that I, I actually have a bottle of it from from botanical colors that <laughs> I don't really use that much maybe maybe I should um, but it seems to it I mean it the color seems to really stay anyway I think maybe mm -hmm. the kind of double mordant of the iron with the tannin uh, it's kind of it just it digs in. I mean, the canvas, the canvas is definitely, um, I wash it first, but it's not scoured per se. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you talk about rust and damage to the fabrics? Any kind of damage? Is that kind of part of your process or, you know, is, are you just really careful with it? Well, I am careful with it. And it's, you know, like I said, you really have to get kind of a feel for what it will do. And, um, you know, on very fine fabrics, it can just take a couple of minutes and then it'll start to degrade the fabric. So you just have to keep an eye on it. I mean, I kind of, I've been doing it for, for quite a while now. So I kind of have a pretty good feel, although I have to say, you know, I can be surprised too. There have been times where I've left heavy linen out on the terrace wrapped in rust for weeks and then untied it. And I don't know if the the attachment wasn't good or something. And there's like nothing. There's mm -hmm. like, it didn't do anything. Um, and then other times in just a few hours, it's, whoa, wow, okay, it's done. I got to unwrap that right away. So um, there's not really, it's kind of, you just kind of get a feel for it. And the things that were that are damaged, um, I save them and I'll stitch them, you know, I'll cut them up and I'll stitch them into, into some sort of piece. Um, is there something that you're using at all? Somebody's asking about um, they, to neutralize the process. Is there something that you can use to neutralize it besides just pulling it out and taking yeah, it? I've, and I've heard that, that, that soaking in, in, a, in a saline solution will neutralize the rust. But then I've also heard that that's not the case, that nothing really neutralizes rust. I mean, India Flint, not a big fan of rust dyeing. And, um, you know, she's, she's the echo print um, goddess. And, uh, and I, I love her books. I, I, I love her work. Um, but, you know, she says, you know, working with rust, you know, it's just a can of worms and, you know, trouble ahead. And that just really hasn't been my experience. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, I do tend to, I'll do a salt, you know, bath afterwards just because I heard that it neutralizes, but I don't know that it really does. Mm -hmm. Somebody wants you to now teach a class on botanical colors on rust dyeing. So we'll have to talk we'll about talk. that. Talk. <laughs> so, um, with, with black walnuts, are you using whole or are, are you using them whole? Somebody's asking them or are you pre-soaking? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, lots of questions about the corrosion process. Lots of questions. What is dye liquor and what is a cutter blanket? Oh, a cutter, well, the, 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 rust, the rust liquor is um, the one-to-one -one water vinegar uh, solution with rusty bits or metal bits in it and you leave it for a few days and you get this kind of iron, iron liquor, rust liquor I call it. Um, that then you can use um, in your process. So it's another way to get to, to dye with rust, liquid rust, as opposed to the, the solid rusty objects. What was the other question? I forgot. Yeah, two people actually asking, what, what is a cutter blanket? Oh, cutter blanket. Cutter blanket is a blanket that is so worn out that it would end up in a landfill but we're going to cut it up and we're going to make something new out of it instead of putting it in a landfill. Yeah. And that's that's a, a good thing to do. Yeah. Um, what type of containers do you store your in process works in while they're curing? <laughs> You're like my favorite cereal bowl. <laughs> plastic. I have to admit plastic bags. Plastic bags because they have to stay damp. So I recycle a lot of plastic bags. I mean, plastic, right? The devil, you don't want to use plastic. But I do have some plastic bags and I just, I use them over and over again. 
until they disintegrate. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, I don't actually buy them, but the ones that I kind of get that I, you know, kind of come by, um, I use those because the, the whole, the process has to stay wet. That's the point, okay. it's got to stay wet. I guess that leads into this question. So, but about washing instructions, what, what kind of washing instructions do you give for your home fabrics, like napkins, should rusted fabrics or finished pieces not be placed against any other home furnishings like silk or a couch or dot, 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 question well, mark. The wonderful thing about rust is it's that it's light fast and color fast and it doesn't really, it doesn't rub off. It, um, the, the plant dyes will fade and change, like the patina will change over time. That's kind of, that goes with the territory with natural dyeing, of course, and that, you know, you either like that kind of thing or you don't. So, um, but the rust really has staying power and it doesn't, you know, you can, I have napkins that, you know, I mean, this, this piece here, this has been washed, I don't know, hundreds of times. Mm thousands of times, I don't know, it's a, it's a hand towel in the bathroom. And, um, you know, washing machine, and then I line dry mostly. I don't tend to use the dryer. Washing cold water with a pH neutral, like mild detergent, and um, you're good to go. They're very durable. I like how there's so, there's so many different things going on. Like you, you just saying a hand towel, you can't tell if you got like, if there's something on your hand that was black or some other color, it just kind of mixes into the design itself. Yeah. Well, listen, we've got like 37 new messages I'm seeing underneath what I'm going to ask. So we're going to compile them into, I'll, I'll edit through them and, uh, and send them to you. And then we'll, when I put the post up for the recording for this, hopefully we'll, you know, if you don't finish finish them in time, that's fine. I'll just add them later and tell everybody that they are in there. And I was thinking too, it might be nice to get a little recipe from you to just stick in there, like a little basic, mm -hmm. little, you know, yeah, a little basic kind of a recipe. So we'll we'll talk about that after. But I know Kathy wants to um, say a couple things about next Sing week. Sing the goodbye song. I'm not singing the goodbye. Well, song. We're not going to torture these guys again. <laughs> no, that was fun. It was fun, wasn't it? Okay, I'm just going to tell you, first of all, thank you, Samantha. That was so amazing, awesome, incredible. The thought that you're putting into what you're making, who you're serving, how you're navigating is super inspirational for us because um, those of you who know me pretty well know I've been doing a lot of drooling over here in the corner. Uh, it has just been so crazy for us. Um, and I know for many of you throughout the U.S. and, of course, throughout the world, it's been as crazy or crazier. So we're just trying to stay sane and healthy in this kind of wild time. So thank you for that perspective. It was extremely um, inspiring for me. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about next week. Um, John Marshall is going to be our presenter and John is a textile artist who grew up in a Japanese American community uh, outside of Sacramento and the man is more Japanese than me I swear to God um, he he's uh, spent many years apprenticing in Japan and he's taken his knowledge of Japanese traditional textiles and just allowed us to have this peek into many of these traditions that we would never actually be able to experience outside of Japan. Um, he's going to be visiting us with us next week and um, I don't even know what he's going to be talking about but he is funny as hell so we're going to have a good time. Maybe he'll start dancing to the theme song along with the rest of us but don't miss that. And uh, Amy is there anything else I need to say no um, we open just, it up let's unmute and say thank you and ooh, i do have one Samantha. thing yes ma'am you know um you guys have been sending some really great letters and we started a series on the on our blog that's called love letters feedback friday love letters because for some of you this is like the perfect ending to your week 
it's keep you know it kind of punctuates the end of getting through some you know another seven days of being cooped up in our houses so if you have something you want to say something you know i know lots of you are starting new projects because of it or just trying new things and not afraid just you know i in the on the blog that for love letters my email's on there which is just sustainability at botanical colors and i would love to put your stories up send me an image of something you're working on and you know let's just keep even though we do this every friday let's keep everybody inspired kind of at least yeah there's some hours. amazing work coming out of just oh, good, us being able to gather it's it's been amazing <laughs> yeah Thank i look at the so tags much. on botanical colors and i'm like oh my god this is yeah. just incredible yeah we we're we're going everywhere all yeah. right well thank you thank you everyone no, Sing mute song, Amy. Hi. Unmute. hi guys thanks, thanks hi, everybody all right thank you samantha hey you guys got to learn the lyrics because we're thank all going to sing it so together much. hi diana yeah. thank, hi. You. Uh, thank you hi, hi diane <laughs> hi kip hi nan Thank oh, you. Man. Columbia, yeah. thank you. Thank so you much. from Montana. Hi. Hi. Oh, you're Montana. welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We had somebody thank from you. Alicante, you. I saw. Woo. Thank you. The whole world is here. Look at us. Yeah, thank the world you. is thank here. What is your shirt? Oh, this is, these are onion peels. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> it I is. Nice. It with onions. Nice yeah. job, huh? Yeah. Oh, Little boy. botanical colors. Uh, Acid, alum acetate, <laughs> a little mordanting, then it just under bluey, wrap it up, steam it, done. Done. Walk over. Yes. Mic drop. Mm -hmm. Hi guys, time to go to work. All right, oh, bye no. guys. Okay. Bye, 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 bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank you, Kathy bye, and Amy. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much. Bye guys. Bye. Bye. Uh, all right, Amy, I'm signing off. Bye. Oh, I should probably stop the recording. Stop the recording. Yeah.